Welcome back to our course in AP Physics. We have finished our study of mechanics and now we enter into the next phase which is a study of electricity and magnetism. So this unit will begin with an overview of electric charges and fields. So first of all a few comments on electric charge. We know it exists because of its effects on the region that surrounds it but we really don't know what it is at a truly fundamental level which can also be said of forces such as gravity. They're basically two kinds and they are positive and negative. Where we know that likes it repel, like charge is repel, two pluses, two negatives, opposites attract. Those are ideas you learn in junior high. Most bodies are essentially neutral however which is really good because if they weren't it would have tremendously deleterious effects in our world. And the reason they are is because there's equal numbers of positive and negative charges associated with it, so they are neutral. A charged object has an excess of one, one kind of charge, either the positive or the negative. And we're really talking about a small fraction of the amount of charges that could be possibly removed from it. So on the order of a trillionth or so of the charges. So never think in terms of, oh, I've taken all the excess charges, or more directly, I've taken all the charges away from this object, and therefore it's fully charged. We don't ever fully charge any macro objects. Very small fraction. Moreover, charge is conserved. The total charge in the universe is essentially constant, and it's equal numbers of plus and minus charges, which again is very good because of the total quantity was different of one version compared to the other, it would rapidly dominate over the gravitational force as far as the evolution of large-scale structure in the universe like stars and galaxies. Now conductors, charges are able to move easily. Metals, for instance, they have free electrons that enable the negative charge carriers to move around the matrix, the object itself. So those charges can freely move. In solutions we have ions that are responsible for carrying the charge, plus and minus ions. Then in semiconductors, you know, the devices that make up your computers and other electronics, we have N-type. Basically it's the semiconductor material is doped with either n-type or p-type material. An n-type an n-type doping results in atoms having excess free electrons in the valence shell, whereas p-type it's the opposite. It's a uh, reduction in the overall average number of electrons available and the absence of electrons is is the same thing as saying there's a hole. A hole is the absence of an electron so it looks like positive charge carriers are responsible for its essential function. And then we have insulators and they contain very few free charges so we don't have the conduction of electricity associated with insulators in general. Now electrical effects can be explained by either negative charges moving or positive charges moving or both moving simultaneously in opposite directions. And before it was understood what was really going on here, Benjamin Franklin, thank you, which charge is thought to move doesn't really matter because functionally you can think of either one moving and you get the same results. But by convention, a long time ago, it was decided that we would consider positive charges moving. So in all of our subsequent definitions and analysis, we consider the flow of electricity as being in the direction of the flow of positive charge, even though it's actually electrons typically moving that are actually moving. Positive charges themselves are just changing places in the opposite direction as a result of the movement of electrons from atom to atom. Now there are basically three ways to charge an object which is easy to demonstrate. Just explain them briefly here. First we have friction. If you take a piece of fur and rub it on an ebonite rod for instance, Charge is transferred by that rubbing. It's a mechanical force that you could think of it crudely as scraping the electrons off 
of the rod or scraping electrons off of the fur. In that case, in the case of the ebonite rod and fur, that's actually what happens. So electrons are removed by the rod from the fur and you obtain a charge. The second type is by contact. So you have a charge rod, say, and you bring it over to, a, say, a neutral object. Well, there's the excess charge that's on the rod will push those charges or attempt to push those charges off onto the object that it's coming in contact with. So when it comes in contact with it, some of the charges get pushed off and by repulsion, and um, the object is then charged that came in contact. And then we have induction, which is a little more interesting. You have a, an induced effect where nearby charges are redistributed, inducing a charge in the other object. And in this way, you can actually produce the, the opposite charge of the object, this charge of the object you started with. So again, this is easily demonstrated and make sure I do that for you. And now we have Coulomb's Law. Coulomb's Law, very similar to Newton's Law of Gravitation. For point charges, you can really think of these as um, little gravitating objects, but it's the electromagnetic force, not the gravitational force. However, the electric force is an inverse square law. See the R squared here? And it's also proportional to the two charges instead of the two masses. The units, newtons for the force, meters for the radius, the charges, coulombs. And that is C, coulombs of charge. And then K is the proportionality constant that makes it all work, which is approximately 9 times 10 to the 9th newton meter squared per coulomb squared. Now, a better form for this basic coulomb force law relating force with electric charge and distance would be to express it as follows, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q1 q2 over r squared. So what we've done is replace the k with 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, where epsilon 0 is called the permittivity of free space. The permittivity has to do with the ability of an electric field to exist in the medium. The medium we're talking right now is no medium, namely a vacuum. And its value is 8.8 .8 times 10 to the negative 12. So 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 is actually the proportionality constant k. And we have as fundamental charge units the electron, negative e, negative elementary charge, that e there. We have the proton, which is the other basically physical object that has fundamental charge, and that's a positive elementary charge. Where the elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Now, because all of us in our intuition feel as though the electric force, the electromagnetic force, is not that dominant, is not that fundamentally powerful, when we seem to be subjected to the gravitational force much more significantly. Let's put that intuitive assumption to the test. By comparing the electric force and the gravitational force between the fundamental charges, electron and a proton. So here's the masses of the two, electron and proton and the elementary charge. And so what we're going to do is consider these two objects and the gravitational force between them, equal and opposite forces, and then the electric force between these same two particles, equal and opposite. And I wonder if my relative vector sizes here are somewhat proportionately scaled. I guess we'll find out. You probably already know. Well, it'll be very stark momentarily. So to reveal that, let's do the ratio of Fe over Fg. And so just plugging in 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q squared over r squared, that is the electric force between those charges, and the gravitational force, g, mass of the proton times the electron mass over r squared. Now both of them are inverse square laws. So the fields, both the electric and the gravitational field, 
have two degrees of freedom. They diverge in three-dimensional space so that we have this inverse square effect being the same for both. So it divides out as it ought to, intuitively, conceptually. So we have 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. And by the way, if my first comment about this, which is that constant k, seems quite mysterious, hopefully the idea that this permittivity constant is associated with the ability of an electric field to exist in space makes some sense at this stage of our understanding. You might wonder where the 4 pi comes from. All that will become clear as we progress along. So hang tight and we'll have greater understanding before too long. And then the rest of this is just q squared over g mm, proton and electron. So let's plug the numbers in. 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, 9 times 10 to the 9th, times the ch elementary charge squared over the, the, the gravitational constant, very small number, the proton mass, an extremely small number, and the electron mass, an extraordinarily small number. So putting all that together, we get the facts, nothing but the facts here. Regardless of what we experience in our everyday lives, the electric force reveals itself to be a thousand trillion 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 times stronger than the gravitational force. Well, if that didn't impress you, I'll say it another way. It's a thousand million 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 times stronger than the gravitational force. So the effects of the equal number of positive and negative charges in the universe is indeed extremely important and also extremely sensitive to the way in which our universe has enabled, been enabled in its evolution as a result of gravity, where the electric force is essentially nullified because of the equal and opposite number of charges in the universe as a whole.